it is 6.30, so um, thank you all for joining us. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to Northern Kentucky History Hour. Um, I'm your host for tonight, Heather Cook. Um, I am a freshman at the College of Worcester studying history, political science, and pre-law. I work as a visitor service associate at the museum when I'm not in school. And tonight I'm coming to you live from my dorm in Worcester, Ohio. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our guest presenters tonight. Um, but first, um, I'd like to thank all of those who make Northern Kentucky History Hour possible. Um, History Hour is a project of the Berenger Crawford Museum, Northern Kentucky History Museum. Berenger Crawford Museum is supported in part by the City of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol Ann and Ralph V. Hale Jr. U.S. Bank Foundation, and our members. If you're not yet a member of the museum, please consider joining us. Um, you can earn access to discounts and exclusive programming, as well as joining the great community that we have here at the museum. You can learn more um, at our website, bcmuseum.org. Um, before we begin, let's go over a few reminders. Everyone's microphones have been muted upon entry so that we can all focus on the presentation, but you are um, free to turn your videos on or off, um, depending on what you prefer. But just so you know, if your video is on, others on the meeting are able to see it even when the screen is being shared. Um, there will also be a trivia question tonight. So the first person to type the correct answer in the chat um, will win a Northern Kentucky History Hour pin. Um, if you have a question or comment to share, please type it in the chat and we will try to get to as many questions immediately following the presentation. Um, so let's meet tonight's speakers. Jason French, who joined the museum in 2017, holds a master's in public and applied history from Northern Kentucky University and a bachelor's in interpretive history from Ohio University. He previously served as a coordinator of costume interpretation for the Cincinnati Museum Center. Emily Simpson is a PhD candidate in the geology department at the University of Cincinnati, focusing on paleontology. Uh, she holds a master's from East Tennessee State and a bachelor's from North Carolina State University. She has worked on a wide variety of projects, ranging from prehistoric plants to researching in BCM's archives. Jason and Emily, welcome. Try that again, Jason. Thank you for having us. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so this is kind of exciting for me because as the curator here at Carriger Crawford, I get to work with amazing people like Emily. And one of the projects we've been working on um, and something that's been near and dear to my heart is actually understanding what William Berenger wrote down in his journals. So we have this tremendous collection of the Berenger journals and um, William was this tremendous collector of all kinds of things. And he documented his journeys. He wasn't ever somebody who had a tremendous amount of wealth, but he was frugal with his money and did what he wanted to do and what he was passionate about. And he documented it in his journeys and his trips in his journals. And he also documented a lot of what he was collecting. So from understanding our foundation collection here at the Marriage Crawford Museum, we have to understand and really get into his journals. And that's one of the things that Emily and I have been doing in regards to some of the uh, happenings with fossils and big bone lick and this uh, dry dredgers group. So when Emily and I've been talking about what she's been finding and I thought how fun that would be to share with everybody the items that were being found uh, here in his journals and some of the things that we're coming across uh, and I hope you all enjoy it tonight because it's really some amazing treasures and also it's helped our understanding of the foundation of dry dredgers and some of these other groups because Berenger and Ellis Crawford were kind of along for that ride. So Emily can you tell us a little bit about um, what you've been doing and what I've kind of asked you to do um, and why you wanted to find out about the dry dredgers and, and really 
what dry dredgers are, what they are and what they, they've done in the past. Yeah, so I came at this from kind of two, with two interests in mind as I was, uh, and two reasons that I wanted to start going through the journals in the first place. One of those was because I am a member of Dry Judgers and have been since I moved here to work on my PhD in 2019. Um, and Dry Judgers is an avocational fossil club, which means that it's a place where professionals, people who get paid to be paleontologists, and people who don't get paid to be paleontologists come together um, and they listen to lectures and give and give lectures about paleontology and lo especially locally. Um, they go on trips to look for fossils. Um, and frequently, um, although more frequently pre-COVID, they also are very active in outreach. Um, so it's a great group. I was in a similar one back home that was actually inspired by dry vectors. Um, and they've been doing this since 1942. And really, if you get into it, they've been doing it since even before that, because they, there was a group of people going on lectures and going out and collecting fossils together in Cincinnati. Um, going back into the 40s, maybe late 1930s, that was the core group that became the Dry Treasures. Um, the other reason I was interested in diving into these journals is because the museum has specimens from Big Bone Lake in Kentucky, um, which is a ice age fossil site that's known for mammoths and mastodons and bison, um, that I actually used some of the specimens in this collection for research of my own. And in doing that, I became interested in us eventually updating some of the exhibits related to that. And I wanted to tell the story of why on earth those fossils were in this museum in the first place, because many of them have notes on them about being collected by Beringer or by Crawford. Um, so to me, that meant going into the journals and looking for kind of the story of how he found these. And so we've been finding accounts of him going on these trips and accounts of him going to dry dredgers. Um, and he was involved in that group from its very beginning and even a little bit before. Well, that's what has been exciting for me as you've been finding things um, is understanding because I was not as familiar with dry dredgers. I heard about them over the years of working in museums and, and I knew that they were uh, um, kind of amateur uh, and professional uh, paleontology group. And they do a lot with Ordovician fossils yes. because this is known for Ordovician fossils in our area. Um, but I, I didn't realize that there would be such an interesting connection with its origins and William Beringer. And Beringer, as I said, he was a collector of all kinds of things. So he, he liked going on these adventures and documenting them. So I was, I was excited to find through your research, the interesting things that he was coming up with, the, what we, that filled out, um, the story a little better. Um, so you were saying at one point, um, isn't there a, um, some maps and things of, of trips that he went on with dry dredgers? Yeah, so actually the reason that we expected Behringer, I'm sorry, the reason that we expected Behringer to even have anything about the dry dredgers in the first place before I even opened up the journals is because um, for the around the 75th anniversary of Dry Dredgers, we're coming up on their 80th now. Um, their president, Jack Calmer, and a few other people were really interested in their history and got digging into an archive that they haven't done. And they had just enough that they knew Beringer's name. So if you're a member and you go into their website, you can actually see these documents um, or you can ask him for permission to view them. And um, so I knew from that that Beringer had been involved in this group, but I didn't know to what extent. They just had a couple of things that had his name on it. Um, and then we get into his, his notes and his journals and he's got postcards announcing the meetings. He's got descriptions of trips with them. He's got descriptions of like the lectures themselves. Um, notes about actually going to those lectures and field trips with Crawford. And all kinds of just other phenomenal resources. Um, 
one that was really neat, if I can get it pulled up here. Yeah, I think as we do have some visual uh, pictures and a, a slideshow we can try to share with you. Yep. Let's see here. Which it is not cooperating. Of course. Here we go. So we actually have his membership card now in his journal from. Can they see this? Yes, should okay. be able to. Um, from as far as I can tell, the first year that Dry Judgers formed. So even though he's not on the list of founding members that Dry Judgers has, uh, these are the people who were on the charter when this group got together. He was going from the very beginning and he was going to the lectures before that. So this was something that he was interested in. Um, he had been collecting fossils around him for a while, for some, a couple decades, as far as I can tell. He was very interested in local archeology, span which the dry judges also used to cover. Um, and he was apparently very eager to get involved in this when it first formed. So if you go anywhere in Cincinnati or Northern Kentucky, if you can find rocks, you're probably going to see your division fossils. Um, your division is about a time period that's about 450 million years old. Um, so it's much older than the dinosaurs and Cincinnati was underwater. So you're likely to see coral, you're likely to see um, snails, shells, all kinds of things. And a lot of times it'll just be in like, he called it fossil rock when he found it, but we'll sometimes call it fossil hash. It's just a pile of limestone that has a bunch of little fossils in it. So isn't there somewhere where it talks about his first fossil? Yeah, so in his journals, he talks about one trip in particular to Davout Park. Um, so coming here, that it was a trip the dry dredgers took, but he talks about several years before that, finding a fossil that he thought was a snake um, at Davout Park. And he came back here with Dr. Castor, who was kind of the founding professor uh, behind dry dredgers and a group with him. Um, and while they were here, Dr. Castor made a map for them that this was actually, again, this was actually in Dry Dredger's archive, not in one of the journals that we have. And it's very rough, but this is a map of the stratigraphy of Dubu Park. Um, so if you look, I'm hoping you can see my mouse. There we go. Um, we, there is a set of blocks up here that is just kind of, it's just very quickly sketched, but it's Beringer had gone back and labeled it as the children's home. Um, and today, if you go out and look, children's home is at the top of the hill of, of one of the hills in Dubu Park. And then kind of going down the hill, he's got labeled um, divots as sinkholes. Well, now down the hill from um, the children's home is the golf course. And if you go out to looking, go out there and walk it, sure enough, they kind of just used the as far as I can tell, the natural topography of the park, I'm pretty sure those are sinkholes. And so if you keep going down the hill, you get to, down to a creek that is now covered by trees and grass. There's a golf course. But at one point, there very well could have been, you know, this is 80 years ago, there very well could have been rock faces exposed. And it's very likely that he was finding these fossils. And he continued to write that, um, he showed this fossil that he had found to Castor and said, I found a fossil snake, which didn't exist yet in the Ordovician. division. And Castor actually identified it as Orthoceros, which I have a picture of what that looks like. Oops. Um, which is actually a squid-like animal and relative of squids. Um, We'll also call them sometimes, or this kind of group of fossils, we'll call them the limonites or squid butts. Um, and it's just kind of this hard part, hard shell that a squid uses for a little bit more structure. Um, so, but he had thought it kind of looked like a snake because of its te texture, and I, at least that's my best guess. So. Well, and it's it's interesting. So going back to the map that is really pretty close to where we are in Beringer Crawford yeah. so our location at the Dubu home um, is close to um, children's home and this is actually where they went on this trip is behind 
um, us here in Davout Park. So it was fascinating to go on that walk with Emily the, the day that we kind of figured out the topography and see how it connected not only to the history of dry dredgers and, and William Berenger, but how it connects. It's in our it's in our side yard or our backyard. It's right here. Um, and that they were finding fossils right here on the park 80 years ago. Although I they if I, my, my memory is they didn't think they found that many on that trip. Um they there wasn't a lot, but I mean, if you're used to seeing the Cincinnati fossils and you're just seeing really common stuff everywhere, um, and then, you know, you only find a piece of a trilobite or an orthoceris or a couple of shells, that's not all that exciting because you just, you get so used to finding so much in these deposits. Um, so in particular this day, Beringer himself only found one small trilobite. Um, and to be fair, trilobites are not that common, especially not whole pieces of them in the deposits around here. So to find a whole one that's actually recognizable as a trilobite is super rare. Um, that said, I do feel like I need to say, like throw this out there as a responsible collecting thing. Please don't take a shovel to Davout Park in the golf course. <laughs> They Please don't go look. That. These are very common fossils, and I, we would be happy to help you find a place to go look for them responsibly. That would be much easier. One favorite is Trimble Fossil Park over the river in Cincinnati. Um, you can find pretty much the exact same fossils. It's very similar deposits. So, um, so this map shows our our um, history here, but Berenger and 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 he was writing all kinds of other things with fossils, right? And, and some of his trips to Big Bone Lick and, and other things. Um, what have you been finding with that? Oh, goodness, where to start? Um, so Berenger had been going to Big Bone Lick and even been going with Crawford long before he was in Dry Dredgers. Um, his first trip was actually in 1931. And on that particular trip, if I can... It, it pulled up here, I apologize. Um, on that first trip, he wasn't with Crawford yet. I don't think they knew each other yet at that point. Um, there's about a decade gap in my information, so I'm sorry. Um, they found literally bags and bags of specimens and he described it as there being hundreds of fossils. There are not that many <laughs> big bone lick specimens in the collection today. There's no telling where they've ended up since then. Um, but this led to, you know, he to make multiple trips to Big Bone Lick. Um, he took different people with him each time. On this particular trip, there was actually a child with them that was very excited to find fossils. Um, they explored archaeological sites that aren't, their locations are known, but they've been covered up for their own protection now. So you can't really see them at the park anymore. And he just tries going to them. And this was before Big Bone Lake was a state park. And him going to this and probably introducing Crawford to the site probably directly led to Crawford getting universities interested in these to later excavate them, which ultimately led to it becoming a state park. Um, can you need a skull cap over there? What's neat though is of the few fossils that we have here, we have been, I've been looking for any mention of fossils that we have that I can tied to what we have on display and what we have in collections at Baron Crawford. And there's one that he drew in this particular entry that was a uh, bison crania or skull cap. Um, and he draws it and it, it's a rough sketch, but you can always tell from his rough sketches what things are. It's really interesting how much detail he works into kind of scribbles. And I do want to stress that this map was not drawn by him. His scribbles are slightly better than this map. Um, but he, he drew kind of a curved line where he measured the size of it. And as far as we can tell, it matches the size of this one. And that's a very specific part for us to be able to, it seems likely that this was the one he found that day. So it's kind of neat that we've been able to trace the specimens back to that day. Yeah, that, and that's what I was really hoping with, 
with kind of digging into the Behringer journals all along is we have so many specimens, artifacts, other items that are here in our collections that we are pretty sure came from Behringer. But if we can document specifically dates and time through his journals, it gives us a much better context to our collection. There's other items that we might thank our Behringer, but we don't know until we find them in the journal itself. So the skull cap is something that a lot of Behringer stuff occasionally he would write on. So we would know that, gee, this was William Behringer because he wrote on it. And he said, this was mine and I found it in 1932 or, or whatever. This particular specimen doesn't have writing on it, but there is a picture in one of his journals that sure, it, it's highly likely that it's the match. And a lot of the ones he wrote, he wrote on, some of them he may have gotten from other collectors because the years just don't match up with what he was going himself. But he also talks in his journals about going to collectors and trading artifacts or buying artifacts. Um, and so we've been kind of able to trace that as well. And we're keeping an eye out for being able to match those stories and those people to the fossils themselves. Right, right. And that's, that's you know, that's part of the fun of the Barringer Journal is you never know what you're going to read in there and what he's he's running across, what he's finding, the people he meets. There's, you know, whether it's a hunting trip or a fossil trip or, or um, just a, a, a bicycle trip, they're all in his journals. Um, and it's just fun to kind of, to follow his adventures, um, you know, there's all kinds of things in those journals. There's his, he, you know, one of his trips to Europe he took, he was on the Mauritania and there's all the menus from his second class fare going to Europe on the Mauritania, that steam ocean liner. So it's, it's just really interesting or, or world's fairs he went to. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of an adventure itself digging those out in, in the Behringer journals and it helps us and the, the, what I've been excited about with the dry dredgers and that it is just understanding that kind of origins of, of semi-professional and professional fossil hunting and understanding in the 20th century um, and how closely tied our institution at Behringer Crawford is with that through William Behringer through Ellis Crawford, you know, Ellis Crawford's tie to the origins of Big Bone Lake as a state park and how that connects to, to William Berenger and, and how our, our collection is pivotal and, and so important to that. And that was such excitement for me. Um, and that's why I love having somebody like Emily that, that has a slightly greater understanding of some of these things that I have the ability to have all the time to come in and look at it and go, oh wow, look here. This is this is here. We didn't know this existed. And here it is, uh, just kind of hidden away in um, our Behringer journals for us to to find and then be able to share with the world. So I just flipped to um, one of the journal pages. That's the description of one of these trips to Big Bone Lake. And this was, I believe this is one of the later ones that he took with, with Crawford and with Dry Dredgers. And he talks about, it, it's so interesting because you get a sense of what he found, but he also talks, oh, this is the one with the bison in it. Hey, I did have it. Oh, excellent. Um, I'm sorry. So. Actually, you can kind of see his little sketch of that bison crania right there. Um, and it's just small, it's quick, it's labeled that horn to horn, it was 22 inches long. And that's not a lot of information to go on, but it sure fits. Um, and again, that's a very specific number for this guy to be 22 inches and be that kind of same length horn to horn. Um, but in this one, he, you know, he talks about the people he saw, he talks about lugging these bags of bones back to his car while everybody else kind of kept looking and wasn't all that excited about it. Um, he talks about processing everything the next day and to my um, dismay, varnishing everything 
and writing the notes actually on it. It's great that he wrote the notes on it because otherwise we wouldn't really know that much more, but my oh gosh, why did you varnish the specimens? <laughs> we have changed our methods. Well, the other fun thing, um, when we're dealing with Berenger at this point in time in his life, so in the 1940s, Berenger was born in 1884 and he died in, in 1948. So we're towards the end of his life and he is turning into a grumpy curmudgeon. And it's kind of fun to read that in the journals, his, his uh, comments about people or, or, you know, why is he having to carry all of these things when, you know, there's other people that are younger that are not helping him. Um, you know, he's, he's got certain opinions why he thinks other people haven't shown up or, or whatever. And that's always kind of funny because um, Berenger was a very interesting man. He, he, um, he was definitely um, a little, I mean, he was just very interesting. He, he would, I would say maybe a little atypical, um, the way he thought, what he was interested in, how he may have even processed information. Um, and when he didn't fully understand somebody else, he would get a little angsty. He would get a little uh, grumpy about it. If he couldn't figure out or understand like why they were behaving that way, um, he, he didn't necessarily have a great deal of empathy for others sometimes. Yeah. Um, and he could be, it was, it's amusing to read into that and understand a little bit this man's personality, especially as an older gentleman. Um, you know, the other aspect is you're looking through this and you're seeing his writing. William Berenger only had a sixth grade education. Um, he was born in 1884. By the time he was 13, which he would, would kind of think is a little old for the sixth grade, but well, as a 13 year old, he left school and started working, um, surprisingly, uh, in a varnish room in a furniture factory in Covington. So maybe that's why he liked varnishing so much. <laughs> yeah, um, I do also like a lot of these stories he tells and, and the kind of grumbling or the excitement about fossils. I, I have definitely compared people telling stories about going fossil hunting or even like our actual excavations that we take as paleontologists. Sometimes they start to sound like big fish stories. Um, they sound like that fishing trip that you exaggerated, the big one that got away that you had to leave in the field definitely comes up. And some things never change because that's how we tell those stories now. And he definitely tells those stories that way. So there's one trip that he took in 47. And keep in mind, um, he, he passed away in 49. So this is, yeah, so, yeah, right in that range. Right. So, so this is when he's getting on up there in years. And he talks about, this is one of the last field trips that he actually went on. Um, he talks about a bus trip that he took with dry dredgers. Um, and he's making notes along the way of what he found and what other people found. And that's all very normal. Um, but he also talks about how he helps save the bus from exploding when there's a gas leak. They had to stop and it could have caused a fire because there was 120 gallons of gas in this bus. And he talks about being involved in this. And maybe that's exaggerated. Maybe it's not, but it's a great story. And then he continues on and talks about this, you know, this elderly man himself at this point. He talks about somebody basically falling out of the bus into the mud and how he shouldn't have gotten his shoes wet because that man was older and was going to make himself sick. So, um, and then continue, it spends about half a page complaining about people singing songs on the bus ride back to Cincinnati. And it was an hour bus ride back. I'm sure that was a lot to sit through after a long day, but you know, they're, they're just, these are stories that are very reminiscent of even how we tell these stories now. Well, and that's, I, I love that, you know, because it humanizes somebody that, that, you know, there's, there's a handful of people that still may have some memories of William Berenger, but there's not a lot of people out there. And when the people that do remember him that I've had an opportunity to talk to, um, uh, you know, they were small. So it, it helps us understand the man that is a namesake of the museum. Uh, and it's also, it's just, it's a lot of fun hearing these stories 
and reading these stories and seeing just what he was getting into. Um, and his journals, I'm, I'm constantly entertained by. Um, and uh, they're just, uh, you might open it up and there might be a, a postcard from someplace he went to or a sketch of something that he found or, or a letter from somebody who his only description is a very, you know, the letter you might pull it out and it's a very pleasant letter from the individual. Um, and they're talking, he's talking about what he's growing, he's got on his farm, somebody that Behringer is doing business and, and a fellow collector. And, and all of Behringer's description on the uh, envelope is this man has seven fingers on his hand. <laughs> So Beringer, the things that he noticed, the things that were important to him um, are, are intriguing uh, and how he describes people. Um, never really disrespectfully. He, he wasn't you know, necessarily derogatory towards people in, in a you know, kind of a modern lens. I, I don't think he was terribly um, disrespectful in that way, but he's just... A, what he noticed, how he described people was always interesting and what he would write about. And, you know, and if, as you look at his handwriting, it's not exactly the easiest thing to decipher. Um, uh, if you've dealt any with, with uh, 19th century writing or 18th century writing, Barringer's handwriting is still pretty easy. It's a little closer to modern handwriting. Um, you are looking at this in a good year. Yeah, this is. It didn't get worse as he got older. <laughs> well, he he also uh, dealt a lot with taxidermy was a, one of his hobbies, and there's lots of descriptions of him um, uh, painting things like turkey feet with arsenic. So his health might have been, uh, well, it might not have helped his health. <laughs> And then another part that's interesting with it is that he does describe this relationship, this friendship with Crawford, um, and has stories about Crawford going on these excavations as a much younger man. The people who remember Crawford now remember him in kind of his older years. So it's just, in, and to see where Crawford was kind of coming from, at least through the lens of Beringer, when he later went back and Curator curated that collection into a museum is fascinating. I'm I'm not sure if uh, the way Beringer spoke, spoke about Crawford some days, I'm not sure I would have wanted to go back and curate his collection. But apparently they were they were decent friends. Right, right. Well, and and it's it's you know there was about a it was over a twenty year difference between in age uh, between them, probably a little closer to a thirty year difference. Um, so the fact that Crawford got to know Beringer um, and showed interest and, and was willing to take him places and to go on um, uh, hunts or fossil hunts or other things, um, I think probably meant a lot to Beringer yeah. that there was somebody else who was interested in what he was doing. Um, and uh, that's kind of... Um, I think a, a special relationship. But yeah, at the point in time that we're reading some of this, maybe Beringer's a little bit of a grumpy old man. Um, but uh, I think he was probably a really fascinating man to get to know um, and had a body of knowledge and an interest that is, is just um, in the vein of, of those early scientists in the age of reason collectors and, and the people that were creating museums 200 years ago, there'd be a guy, I mean, Barringer was not all that educated. He wasn't a man of wealth, um, but he was frugal and he had an interest and he was self-educated in so many things. Yeah. Um, and that, and to think that he was, he was actively getting involved with this this organization, you know, dry dredgers and these going to these lectures, and that's got UC professors and people involved. So Beringer was interested in advancing his knowledge and understanding what he was really coming across uh, in everything that he seemed to do. 
Yeah, and even towards the end of his life, when he, in the last journal, as he's kind of recording not feeling so well and a doctor coming over re relatively frequently, he'll talk about, I didn't feel well today. I don't think this doctor knows anything. But while he was here, I showed him my collection of fossils and artifacts. And I was so excited to tell him about it. And he'll like spend as much time talking about that. Um, and that's like in the end of his life when he's not feeling well enough to write every day too. So this was something that he stayed very passionate about and stayed very passionate about sharing with people. Right, right until the end, which is which is great. And so the, the with dry dredgers, so this is, I mean, he was involved in the beginning. This is, is this their 80th year? So, I mean, is-, is Yeah, yeah. So dry dredgers now will officially, this is their, this will be their 80th anniversary. Yes. And though there were these, um, and so you, you've you got somewhere here, isn't there a pamphlet or something? Uh, do you have a, a picture of that, of of the request of, are you interested in lectures? Or, um, because that was in, in the journal too, where there's this kind of questionnaire that, the the professors were asking of the people who were attending these um, lectures and saying, "Would would you like us to formalize this?" Right? Yeah. So this was one of there. There were multiple letters, and Beringer saved many of them. So we've got some of them. Um, but this was one of those first. Like, if anyone's interested, you should come to this organizational meeting. I don't know if he went to that because, like I said, he wasn't on the original charter. But he's got one letter that I unfortunately don't have a picture of, and I'm sorry. But it's a, an interest letter of we're going to do this. These meetings are going to happen. Here's what the dues are going to be. They were $2 at the time. Um, and we want to know what lecture series you guys would be interested, interested in us hosting. Please send us the survey back. So there's a letter with a list of all the possible um, lecture series they could have gone on to do. I don't have the postcard because he sent it back, I assume, I because uh, he saved everything else. So I just, I assumed that he checked one and sent it in um, and presumably continued to go to the lectures from there as they became a more formal group. So is it, it's $2 annually. Or, at that time, it was $2 okay, annually. It was two, $2 yeah. annually at the beginning. That's, that's really interesting. So, so he was involved in this and... Um, and I've, I'm still just amazed that, that that group, which is kind of, you, you talked about the fossil group that you were involved in growing up, mm -hmm. was influenced by dry drinkers because yeah. it's, it's the oldest in existence in the country. As far as we know, this is the oldest avocational fossil paleontologist group, and they call it geology here, but it, it's the oldest avocational paleontologist group in the country. And there are more of them now, but this was, as far as we know, the first. So that for me is, is such a, an interesting thing. I'm, I'm always fascinated by our connections here in Northern Kentucky to some of these uh, foundational groups, the things that, that people in our region, not just, you know, Northern Kentucky, but regionally, what we've created, um, but then it's it's great when there's somebody like William Berenger that that was kind of part of that. Maybe, you know, maybe he wasn't the 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 guy that was really doing, but he was he was actively wanting to be a part of these groups and go on these fossil hunts and these other trips to advance his knowledge and to learn something different than what he had already done. Um, and throughout his journals, you see him being involved in, in archaeology and, um, and paleontology and, and, you know, also lots of active sportsman stuff, but going to world's fairs and how he talks about the world's fairs, the things that he's interested in, in the different world's fairs, whether it's 1904 or I think 1933 or, or, or some of those when he's taking these trips, you'll find that he's going and he's looking at fossils. He's going and looking at maybe engineering and other things that he's involved in. 
but it's been a passion of his for a very long time. He's always tried to understand the world in which he's lived in. And you see that in his journals and the fact that he was willing to journal and share that so that he could remember his adventures, but also um, those got passed on so that the rest of us can as well and understand, you know, because he, upon his death, he had this tremendous collection. And um, that ends up going to the city of Covington. And with the help of Ellis Crawford and, and Raymond Lyons and, and others in the, involved in the city, we have the William Barringer Memorial Museum being founded, you know, not 80 years ago, like um, uh, dry dredgers, but almost 72 years ago. Um, it'll be um, in July. So these stories and the things that we're finding here in the journals um, help us greater understand the man that we're named after, uh, and the men that we're named after, as well as what we have in our collections that we get to share with the public on a, on a regular basis. What else, uh, is there any, does, is, does anybody have questions? Is there anything, I know we've talked about trilobites and fossils and uh, bison skull caps and, and uh, not fossil snakes and, and other <laughs> things that Behringer kind of, it, it, do we have any questions, anything that anybody was interested in? I don't yeah, know how we are with our time. We did have some questions coming in the chat, so we'll start with those. Um, the first one was if the dry dredgers you were talking about is one at UC. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, and they are currently virtual because of the pandemic. We haven't gone back to in-person yet. Um, highly recommend going on their website and looking into joining the next upcoming meeting. Okay, um, and then we had a question about how you're storing the journals slash scrapbooks because um, they have about 30 similar type books from their grandmother from the 1930s, 60s, and was wondering how to store those. Um, it's best to, uh, if you can, um, you need to probably what, and what we're looking into doing is also finding ways to either photograph or scan so that you're not having to open them up all of the time. Uh, but we also, I would recommend wrapping them in acid-free tissue paper and trying to get acid-free archival boxes that fit them. Now I will tell you that is not an inexpensive thing to do. Um, uh, I wouldn't put them on the, I would lay them down flat and try to find shelving that you can put them on. Uh, the other issue with them is, is if they're like Behringer journals where he has pasted in different types of, whether newspaper clippings or, or postcards, letters, um, photographs, all of that has, it, some of it has diff, um, maybe acidic paper uh, there's going to be acid migration and things. Some of that you're probably going to want to maybe try to put your acid-free tissue paper in between. Uh, depending on the age, the acid migration may have already happened. There's not a whole lot you can do about it. It's going to discolor the paper. The pages might get brittle. But um, uh, you just kind of have to be mindful of that. One of the first things, I mean, well, if the bindings are solid enough and you can take pictures and start um, trying to transcribe and photograph everything in them, it's going to allow you not to have to open them up as much and will protect the items in the future. Um, you wanna keep them in a even temperature, try to keep them away from humidity, um, make sure that there's you know, uh, sometimes you got to watch out about certain insects that you wouldn't think are there. You might not ever see, but you don't want to meet up your paper. Um, but try to keep it as archivally sound as possible. There's lots of uh, information on how to do that online that can help you. But one of the first things I would do, even if you can't afford the archival boxes, you can probably get acid-free tissue paper pretty easily. Um, and, and start either 
wrapping them, but also if you're looking at um, where you might need to have barriers between certain pages. Um, and our next question was, what year is the page 176, 177 journal entry about in BBL? Yeah, so the big bone lift pages I was telling you about, the page that I pulled up that had the bison picture on it, I actually had to go back and double check my year, but it was 1942. His first trip to big bone lift was as far back as 1931. And there were other trips sporadically throughout the years in there. Some with dry drivers, most with not, without. Um, those are all the questions we had come in during the presentation. So if people wanna send some in now, um, while people are asking questions, we can go over our trivia question. Did we have somebody um, that got it? We did. Um, so the trivia question was, what is the first fossil William Berenger found and where did he find it? Um, and our answer was the Orthocerus, um, which was found in Davu Park. And our winner was Deb Power. So congratulations, you'll be getting your prize in the mail within the coming weeks. Congratulations. That's something that was one of those little treasures that we found here in these journals. So we still have about 15 minutes. I don't know if you have anything else you wanna talk about. Um, was, there, was there anything that we had kind of missed? Uh, because there's so much that we could talk about with William Berenger and dry dredgers and all of this, I just, um, I, like I said, I wasn't really aware of where we were with the time, uh, and I wanted to make sure we had time to answer questions. Um, well, while we're uh, while you're thinking about that, somebody just asked if we can see the journals at the museum. If, if we will bring one to show you the journals, occasionally we will put out on display but often the journals are pretty fragile and we're trying to get them in a state where we can display them. Um, I, depending on over the years, I've had them, some of them out in exhibits. Uh, if there's something that we're specifically talking about that I know there's a journal entry, um, but most of the time the journals are in our, our library and archive where we, uh, because of just their fragile nature, we normally don't have them for the public to see. Um, we are, as I said, trying to really find ways to scan and archivally um, maintain them so that we can have them all more on display for people because there really are some of the ones that I love. Um, there's an early one from 1907 where he's talking about early trips that he took, early travels he took, um, that starts with him talking about bicycle rides from West Covington where he lived, out to Wilder, or, or early trips, uh, there was a date that he took um, with a, a young woman from Cincinnati and he goes to Coney Island and he's riding an early version of the Island Queen. Now, the Island Queen that most people or most people's parents might have remembered was the one that was the, the last one, the big one, that burned in 1947. But the Island Queen that he's talking about was 1907 or so, or, or 1904, actually, I think it was, um, somewhere in there. And it was a, it was a fascinating story. Um, where he was really oblivious to the fact that his date was a bad date. His, the, the young woman he was traveling with was not, um, was not really happy with him. Um, but it's a fun little uh, journal entry. But that same journal has his trip to the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, um, which is, you know, really the first place that an American saw a Ferris wheel. There was so much going on there. Uh, it's the grounds of the St. Louis World's Fair. Part of them are where the St. Louis Zoo is now. Um, there was just his descriptions of all that was going on and everything he wanted to see and how he had 
he had worked for the B&O Railroad unloading cars in the evenings to raise the money for him to take a train. Um, he would row a boat across the Ohio River. He, he took a train, he and a friend to St. Louis and how frugal they were because he was trying to save money when he was going to see this fair. Um, and it's just a fun thing. So his journals are really a wealth of things. We do have one here we can kind of hold up and show. Yeah, so this is actually the one from 1942. So that first dry judges year. Um, <laughs> we're laughing a little bit because um, the, we went looking for it earlier. Find find it. It. So it's here. Um, and I'm going to be very careful how I hold this up because there's pages coming out of it. Um, the first pages are always very rough because he has Christmas cards from the previous year in the beginnings of them. And a lot of times they'll be like, this is from Crawford or this is from a, a collector friend or this is from a man with seven fingers on each hand. Um, but I'm going to do my best. And this page that's open actually has one of those in, like interest letters of if you want to compulse, I'm sorry, this is a horrible way to hold this up, but I'm doing the best I can. I can help with one half. Of it. That may help. Can you get that side? I, yeah. Um, so yeah, you've got letters that are like that early interest and in, if you want to do dry judges, join us. Um, and then this is just kind of his um, name and address and the year that he starts every journal off with. And these are just a wealth of information. Like he's, you know, this captures the 40s. So he's capturing the beginnings of World War II. He's capturing events around him. And he's not super interested in what's going on in the world around him, but there's just so many different topics that people could get into. Well, and he, with these. he, the things that he kept, there's other researchers, there's other things that we've got where people are really interested in, in what he kept, the people he knew. Um, and he did somewhat come back through and re-edit journals later, which is also interesting, um, uh, especially around World War II, because he had in the, the in the pre or post-war War One period, he had visited Germany and things. So he had been around, he'd been on trips to Europe. So he was coming back with things that he later removed from his journals. Because he was he was probably a little concerned about anti-German feeling. Um, he had seen the anti-German hysteria and everything in World War One, uh, and how it affected Covent Covingtonians. Um, by the way, these journals are he's often writing in old 19th century ledger books. So the journal may be from 1942, but this book is, you know, probably 50 or 60 years older than that. So that's where we're concerned about how fragile they are. The bindings, the books can be much older than actually the journal inside it. And somebody asked on here, I'm watching other questions kind of start to pop up, but someone asked how many pages they normally are. And it's kind of hard to say because they vary in size, but he also had this habit of pasting entire books into the journals or cutting out pages and pasting them in to use like if he wanted to write more that year. So there's one journal where I get to page about 150 and then suddenly I'm back to page two um, because the numbering starts over. So it's just kind of hard to keep track of how many pages exactly they all are. Um, someone asked how many journal volumes there are. I'm not sure off the top of my head how many are here. There, that's a hard question. I think because unfortunately over the years, um, some of the journals uh, pretty far back um, got loaned out or I mean, Behringer may have loaned them or Ellis Crawford loaned them to somebody to do research or look at, you know, 60 years ago, whatever it was. And they've not necessarily came back to us. So there's some that we know there's, there's scans of, of some of his journals that are at the Kenton County Library. There's some elsewhere. Um, I suspect that he was really journaling. The body of them are probably from a little after 1900 until his death. So we're probably looking at about 40 years 
roughly of journals on an annual basis. Um, how many of those still exist? We've, we've probably got 30 or more here um, in our collection. And then he had some that were also special topics. So there's one that's specifically a travel journal, or there's right. two that are specifically travel journals. There's one that's labeled um, mineralogy that's actually about like early nuclear, it's news clippings about nuclear research that was happening, which is not, that's not mineralogy. <laughs> but, there's, and there's one that traces a pres one of the presidential elections. Yeah, there's one with Garfield, the, the assassination and all of that as well. So there's there's some, um, there's the one with Garfield and stuff is like 1898. Some of his early travel stuff is, I think he was compiling it. Uh, we, we don't seem to have everything. There was probably, he probably had earlier diaries and journals that he compiled into these other documents later. Um, it's a little bit of a mystery and it's kind of a fun one to kind of figure out. Um, but as I said, he, he tended to edit some. There's also a whole book on his family history. William Berenger um, was divorced. He was married and divorced um, in a short order in the early 1920s or so. Um, and that, that is a very amusing uh, read if you want to know about his family history and, and his relationship. <laughs> it's a it's a pretty interesting read too, um, so yeah, he's he's a, a fun guy to kind of dig into his journals. But there's a lot of them, and there's a lot to kind of um, research and source out. And it's been a it's been a, a passion of mine because I understand that to fully understand this collection that I am the curator of and the caretaker of. I need to understand William Berenger. And, and I know that there's, we're going to be able to identify specific artifacts that tie to him, just as we did with his skull cap, through what he's writing in the journals. We also have one more quick question before we wrap up. And is, um, it's, are there any other local paleontology organizations? So I don't want to ignore it. There is one in Kentucky um, that I am not as familiar with just because I am in Cincinnati. I go to University of Cincinnati and I am a long-term member of a group that has um, a relationship with dry dredgers. Um, so another fossil group that's further away from here, North Carolina. Um, so I'm not as familiar with the Kentucky one. I don't know how active they are, and but they as far as I know, do exist. Um, that's really the most local one that there is. I think there's also local mineral rock hounding, another type group along those lines. But I, again, it's not one that I'm as involved in. Um, she asked if it's Falls of the Ohio in Louisville. I don't know. I only, I've only seen their website. I'm sorry. Um, so we are going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I'd like to remind everybody about our special exhibits at the museum. Um, right now we have Spirit Riders, Abracadabra, um, a Harlan Hubbard exhibit, and Huda History, um, which are all on exhibit now through the 24th. Um, so they go away at the end of this month. So make sure you mark your calendars if you want to come see those. Um, and there are still um, open seats for our two summer camps. And you can find out more information about all of these things on our website. Um, once again, thanks for joining us all. We'd like to thank our sponsors and supporters of BCM and the staff, trustees, and members of the museum as well. For more Northern Kentucky history through the week, you can check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel where you can find the latest installment of Jason's Curator's Chats. Um, as well as the rest of the history hours and this one. Um, so please like and subscribe on those videos. As a reminder, there will not be a Northern Kentucky History Hour next week as we continue the bi-weekly schedule, but we will be back on April 20th with um, Jay Erisman of New Rift Distilling. So until then, everyone take care and good night. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.